Welcome to the Bourbon Life Podcast, your source for all things bourbon. Join your hosts, Mark and Matt, as they drink and review bourbons, share news about upcoming events, interview the who's who in the bourbon world, and most importantly, bring you along for the fun of living the bourbon life. Now, here's your hosts, Mark and Matt. All right, everybody, welcome back for another episode of the Bourbon Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and with me, as always, is my good friend, Matt. Matt, how are you doing over there? Mark, man, I'm doing great. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. I'm really excited about this show. I've been looking forward to this one for months. Uh, we've had this one lined up for quite a while, so this is something I've been really just looking forward to getting to and um, really itching to to get to get going. But yeah, it's, you know, it's beautiful. We're in the new year, man. Um, yeah, the weather's not the greatest here in Central Kentucky, but you know, it's winter. So what do you expect, right? I know. I was I was actually just thinking we've had this lined up since oh, I don't I don't even remember, but back in the autumn, that seemed it was like yeah, sixty degrees ago as far as temperature goes. <laughs> and it is it is chilly in Central Kentucky this evening here, but hopefully, bourbon lifers, wherever you're listening to it, it's a little more pleasant than we're having. Yeah, no kidding. But I know she got your toboggan on. The, I'm sorry, your bean. Well, bean. now see, that's a, that's a that's a toboggan, Matt. That's got a rim on it and everything. That's a toboggan. That's not a beanie. That's a full fledged toboggan. You're from Kentucky. I don't think you can really weigh in on the terminology of these things. You gotta <laughs> trust the friends from the north on this one. All right, it's a beanie then. But look, man, I'm growing my scruff. So I'm, I I took your uh, your lead from November where you're no shave, and I've started. But you know, this is like three or four days for me. But I'm going for that Bill Bender look, you know, that whole big <laughs> Yeah, well, well, three or four days for you is you already look better than I did after three or four weeks. So tip my hat for that. Oh, man. All right. Well, we probably need to thank our sponsors so we can jump on into this because I'm really excited and want to get to it. But uh, we do need to thank our sponsors, the Stave Restaurant out in Millville, Kentucky. Um, they're a great restaurant there. Rebecca uh, and Eric uh, Burnworth that own that. Just great people. We appreciate their support. They've been with us as a sponsor from day one. Uh, I think, I'm not sure. I, I was thinking that they may be closed down for a couple of weeks this month um, just to do some renovations and some things out there. So uh, check them out online at the Stave restaurant or the Stave Kentucky.com. Check them out. But man, the food that they make out there is is excellent. It is actually right in between Whitford Reserve and Castle and Key. So if you're on the Bourbon Trail, it's a great place to stop and get some great food. And you can also get some great uh, drinks and bourbon out there as well. And then also Three Chord Bourbon, our other sponsor, our newer sponsor, um, we really appreciate their support as well. Uh, Ari Sussman, the master blender with those guys doing some some great stuff. And uh, we really, we really appreciate them being on board with us. So, Matt, now that I've paid the bills, man, you want to tell everybody what we got going on tonight? Do I ever? Let's get right down to it because there is nothing more that Mark and I can say that's going to be more interesting than this. And joining <laughs> us this evening, if any of our listeners have looked at a bottle of Woodford Reserve, lately they may notice that at the bottom it is actually selected by master distiller and this person has put their signature right on the bottle so joining us is the master distiller of woodford reserve chris morris chris welcome to the bourbon life podcast thank you thank you gentlemen good to be with you yeah we we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us chris like i said this has been on our schedule for a couple months and uh just been really really excited about having you on the show so we're we're really uh, looking forward to this. And, uh, you know, most of our listeners are going to know um, who you are, but what we'd like to do, well, I'll tell you what we'll do first, because Chris, we always forget to do this. We start asking questions, <laughs> we start talking to our guests, and then we forget to talk about what we're drinking. Um, <sighs> so I'll tell you what we'll do first. Um, in this first round, we've got something poured up here. And Chris, um, I mean, do you, do you mind just to tell everybody what we've got, what we're starting with on this one? Well, I think we're by, uh, <clears throat> by agreement. Uh, Mark and Matt, we're going to start with Woodford Reserve Rye, Kentucky Straight Rye Whiskey, yep. and then get into our bourbon expressions later on in our next uh, couple of episodes. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the, I think that's the best way for us to start with the with the rye. And I will admit that uh, I have not had the Woodford Reserve Rye yet, Chris. Um, so oh my this, goodness! I know, I know. I feel I feel bad. I feel bad for saying that. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's funny because my wife and I were talking about this and my wife was a big bourbon drinker before I was a bourbon drinker and her favorite bourbon was Woodford Reserve, or is Woodford Reserve. And that's really when I started drinking. Now, I will tell you, I went to UK 
Um, so back in the day, you know, we would buy whatever cheap bourbon we could afford to buy and take that to the football games or to the parties and whatever. Um, so that was my experience with bourbon for the most part. But I remember when I, when I actually first had Wichard Reserve that I felt like, um, that I was, you know, I was finally drinking a, a grown up bourbon. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, but I've never had the rye. So uh, I'm really looking forward um, to drinking this, but can you tell us a little bit just about the rye itself? I mean, what the, um, cause this is yours. I mean, when, when, when I used to talk about people, to people and I say, Hey, you know, this is, this is your, this is your baby. This is your thing. I mean, this really is yours. There was no Woodford reserve rye until you, you basically came up with it and created it. So do you want to tell everybody about that? Well, yes. Um, Mark, but you're very kind. It, it's mine, but it's also someone else's, <clears throat> excuse me, because this is an actual rebirth of an old rye recipe. Oh, okay. And of course, our parent company is Brown Foreman, the oldest spirits company in America, celebrating last year, hard to believe it's 2021, our 150th anniversary last year. But Brown Foreman had purchased a number of distilleries over, over many years in the past as it was building its portfolio. And one of those was the old Kentucky distillery okay. and bought that distillery in 1940 and it was in Louisville. And that distillery had accumulated brands over its lifetime. And one of them was ca called Old Watermill, Old Watermill. Okay. And it had a corn whiskey, a bourbon whiskey, and a rye whiskey, Old Watermill rye. And that was, dates back to 1881. Wow. And we produced that at the Brown Foreman Distillery in Shively, where I began my career in 1976, um, up until the early 1970s. So I remember that rye in barrel in inventory because production had, had ceased a few years before I began an active uh, employee. So I grew up with this rye whiskey being around. Okay. So again, I had this knowledge of rye whiskey. And then as we move several decades later and the inkling, the beginning of the rye whiskey, I call it a fad now because um, rye whiskey has not taken off like it was predicted to. So that's sort of a fad. But okay. anyway, back in the about 2005 or so, I approached management and said, you know what? I think we need to make a rye whiskey. Because you and I and, and Matt, we could count all the rye whiskeys uh, uh, available at that time on two hands. Right. They were all made in Kentucky. And um, anyway, so I said, we need to make a rye whiskey. And I got approval to make a rye whiskey. So starting from scratch, we're going to make a rye whiskey. I said, well, let's, let's go back in time to the old watermill recipe because obviously we made it. It was a successful product. And that's a good starting place. And that's what, that's what I did. So we take, and again, these recipes and, and you guys have had a lot of great interviews and people, some people won't give out their recipe, the percentage right. of corn, <laughs> rye, et cetera. Like it doesn't matter because those are numbers on a piece of paper. It's the combination of those numbers where you get the ingredients that go in those numbers, the water, the fermentation, yeast, et cetera, distillation and maturation processes that make them come to life. So a grain recipe is, to me, it's, well, it could be proprietary. Why make it secret? It's no big deal. Right. So we took this recipe, which is 53% rye, 33 corn, 14% malt, okay. and put it into the Woodford template. So the limestone water, the old pepper spring at Woodford Reserve, the with reserve strain of yeast, the extra long fermentation process, five to seven day fermentation, which is double the length of any other bourbon distillery, distillation, in, including the copper pot still triple distillation, and the unique Woodford barrel crafted at the Brown Form of Cooperage and heat cycle warehousing to create what I believe is a really approachable, complex, balanced rye whiskey. So it's an old recipe that's been modernized or contemporized gotcha. in the reserve process. So I can't take credit for the ratio 
but certainly for bringing it back to life in its in its new configuration. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I like to tell people, you know, I've tasted I've tasted rye whiskey forever. I don't like rye whiskey. Uh-huh. I, don't, I, don't, I don't like rye whiskey. I'm a bourbon drinker. I'm from Kentucky. I grew up <laughs> in the bourbon industry. Yeah. So if we're going to make a rye whiskey, we have to make rye whiskey I like. Gotcha. And it's really fun to hear from consumers who say that Wood Reserve rye is the most bourbon-like of rye whiskeys on the marketplace. And I take that as a great compliment <laughs> as a Kentuckian yeah. uh, because – because this is wood for rye. I mean, and right. of course we all know that approximately 50 to 60% of a bourbon's character comes from maturation, comes from the barrel. Right. And to have that unique wood for barrel in our heat cycled warehousing certainly drives this rye into the wood for reserve family style. And of course our, our unique, unique yeast strain also helps push it into the wood for reserve family. Gotcha. So I'm just so pleased with it. So here's a rye whiskey I can drink and enjoy. Yeah, that's one thing I noticed definitely. Um, and we'll talk about the nose and stuff here in a second. But as I was tasting it, as you were talking, I mean, it definitely drinks uh, very similar to a bourbon for me. Um, but you do get that rye spice. And now Matt's a rye guy. I mean, so when you said that you're not a you're not a big rye drinker, I could see Matt's facial expression just kind of, <laughs> you know, wilt over there. Um, but Matt, Matt's a bourbon guy and a rye guy, but he loves his rye. So Matt, what do you pick up on this when you, when you give it a, a good nose over there? Well, the first thing I picked up on it was a really nice marshmallow, real nice toasty kind of smoky marshmallow. And then it, it led way to caramel and a little bit of oak. But then I got, uh, I got some, I think I'm picking up like orange, orange citrus. Yeah. Oh, well, the, Matt. You started off with the unique wood reserve barrel, the, the seasoned oak, toasted, charred barrel, the first whiskey barrel in the history of whiskey barrels to be toasted and charred by design. And then you went right into our yeast, which is we, we have so much citrus in wood reserve because of our unique strain of yeast. So you're, you're starting to hit our, our flavor levers that we pull to make our, our whiskey different. Mm-hmm. Very nice. See, that's why I always defer to Matt because he always, <laughs> he's, he's got the better palate. I can talk and he can, he can taste and, and, uh, and share what he's, what he's picking up on that. So, um, yeah, Matt, I agree for sure. Uh, on the, especially on the orange you were talking about, what do you get on the, on the palate? What do you, what do you pick up on that? Oh, I haven't gotten that far yet. Come on. Don't rush me here. Oh, come on, Matt. Come on. <laughs> but the lead fruit in our rye is citrus. Okay. And I'll also be- go beyond what Matt has nosed with the, with the orange and get lemon and, okay. and even a bit of lime. And then we move into tree fruit, which are the pear and apple notes. Apple. In this mm-hmm. rod, this rod doesn't have, you know, dark fruit. It doesn't have berry fruit. It's not uh, tropical fruit. It's more the crisp, bright right. fruit notes uh, that you would expect or hope that a rye whiskey would have because a rye whiskey is supposed to be a bit sharp and, and, and titillating on the palate. Yeah. And I, and I do get that too on the palate, you know, that I get, I get that a little bit of that rye spiciness. It's not, it, it's not like a punch in the face type of rye, like 95 fives. Um, but like you said, it, it's something that a non rye drinker would definitely, if you're a bourbon drinker and you're not a rye drinker and you wanted to try a rye, I think this would be, this would be one that would be a, a great place to, to give it a shot. So Matt, what do you think on the palate? What do you got? I think the fruit really comes through. Like you were saying, Chris, I, I pick up that orange kind of comes through, but it's a little more, a uh, little more subdued almost into like a, like an apricot. And then the finish, or at least like the, the back of the palate is where I was kind of catching way to a little more of the spice and some of the apple, like the, the crispness mm-hmm. really comes through at the end of the palate. I thought, uh, this is um, and the and the spices to me, and of course all of us have our own opinions and our own ability to perceive uh, flavors and aromas, but our spices are very approachable, and uh, some people take offense when I use the term pungent uh, because that is a, that is a, 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 a technical term in the world of whiskey. We don't have pungent spices; we have. 
comfort spices, the brown yep. spices that you would find in the kitchen cabinet or yep. in a bar uh, bar situation, a few savory spices, or some green spices like a little hint of dill and mint, eucalyptus. So all of our spices are very approachable and just make you feel warm and comfortable um, and not the pungent spices that, as Mark mentioned, some of the 95 and 100 percent raw whiskeys may have. Um, and that's not a criticism. That's just a, that's just a call out. That's the way they are. Right. Um, again, those raw whiskeys were not possible in the past. And I'll never forget a number of years ago, uh, a journalist was writing a story back in the early days of micro distilling about um, the, the Maryland rise. And he and he was writing a story, I guess he was from Baltimore, that there were Baltimore rise. There was a classification called Baltimore rise. And he had heard that I knew a lot about rye whiskey. And Brown Foreman, we do have a complete set of the wine and spirits journals from the late 19th and early 20th century in our archives. We have a tremendous archive. So I said, I'll, I'll research this for you. And I found that the industry, the industry had two types of rye whiskey in terms of categories. It spoke about Eastern rise and Western rise. There were no Maryland rise, Pennsylvania rise, and Baltimore or Philadelphia rise. Those were all called Eastern rise. And they had a slightly higher rye content. They still had corn in them and they still had malted barley. Western rise were the rye whiskeys made in Kentucky. We made a lot of Western rise. And Old Watermill is one of those. So rye whiskeys of the previous century are now going back two centuries, had to have corn and had to have malted barley because they had live yeast strains. They had no artificial enzymes. They could not convert sugar to starch without the use of malt. And therefore they had to have relatively low rye content versus today's modern rye whiskeys. Huh. So that's not a knock. It's a fact of life. Right. This is an authentic 19th century Kentucky Western rye whiskey formula. This is the way our ancestors made rye whiskey. No artificial enzymes. That's why you see 14% malt in our recipe. You cannot convert rye and corn into fermentable sugar without the use of malt. And the more rye in your recipe, the more malt is required. Our classic Wood Reserve bourbon is 10% malt. Corn, which is the dominant grain in that recipe, of course, is easier to convert into natural sugar. So again, our products at Wood Reserve reflect the use of natural, authentic processes. That's Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, that's a great story. It's funny because you're talking about the eastern versus western and i had this vision of like the east coast west coast rappers you know battling it out and i could see these guys back in the in 19 uh, <laughs> they're they're battling it out over the east and the west rye so they're maybe they're, i'd like to call it acc versus sc there you go. that's yeah i think that would work that would be great so chris uh, that's i mean we appreciate you telling us that history as well but let's let's talk a little bit about who you are i mean like i said i mean i know our guests know know who you are but can you tell us just a little bit about your your past and how really how you got involved in the uh, in the industry itself and how that led you to where you are at this point well mark i was very fortunate uh very much a, a traditional classic kentucky distiller uh background both my parents worked at brown foreman my father wow. started in 1946 my mother in 1952 and um well, wow. I grew up. I grew up in a whiskey household. I mean, all their friends worked at distilleries, and my father, because of his position at Brown Foreman, uh, he had friends at Shinley and Yellowstone at Glenmore. I mean, distilleries that no longer exist. So I, I thought that was the whole world was bourbon whiskey, and <laughs> uh, and I was fortunate as uh, an eighteen year old uh, that I could legally go to work at Brown Foreman. And uh, dad got me a, 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 a nice position, well, a, a bottom rung position, but I, I right. got to start before I graduated from high school in the old Forester distillery. Wow. And, um, 
and I ne never looked back. I just thought it was a fascinating industry. The people were great. The company was great. Uh, it was just a, the best place to be. So I've been very fortunate uh, because of mom and dad's, uh, their careers brought me into it. And so that got you started with Brown Foreman. Um, now, and then you'd worked some other places before, or did you get, you, you went yes. one place, is that right? So yes. Okay. Um, at, at the time it was the worst thing that ever happened to me, but it turns out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. So in the late 1980s, of course, the bourbon industry is, is tanking. It right. is tanking. And Brown Foreman amongst other companies, um, are adapting and so many companies, again, think about Yellowstone, close in 85, a uh, medley, uh, the list goes on. Right. These facilities are closed and sits well, of course, hangs into 1992, but the industry's in bad shape. So Brown Foreman uh, had to reduce its workforce because the, the Brown Foreman distillery was, was working operating only three months a year. I mean, that's how bad it was for the industry. Bourbon yeah. whiskey was dying at the time. Yeah. And, and Brown Foreman had to let go a lot of the, 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 the younger supervisors. And I was a supervisor at the distillery. I was let go, even though my father was still working there. Thank goodness he was still working. I was let go. It was nothing personal. It wasn't about, uh, uh, about performance. It's like, Guys, there's nothing for you to do. Yeah. But of all things, little old Glenmore Distillery was trying to trying to expand. And that's another whole big story. <laughs> the late Buddy Thompson, bless his heart, what a great guy. But Glenmore was expanding. So I was I was at the right place at the right time, and I was hired by Glenmore. And um, and I spent three wonderful years there and then of all things the biggest spirits company in the world at the time united distillers guinness united distillers purchased glenmore why because it was in the bourbon business and bourbon was starting to become attractive yeah. and i was hired by this british company and they didn't know anything about bourbon <laughs> and little old chris morris did and i became basically in charge of their bourbon business and i spent six years with them traveling the world um, and also uh, reopening the Medley Distillery, which was in Owensboro and yeah. and building, helped build the, the new Bernheim Distillery, uh, which is in Louisville, opened up in 91. So um, I had a great run there, but a good old Brown Foreman called me back and <laughs> uh, I couldn't say no to going back home. And of course, sure my mentor and dear friend, Lincoln Henderson. Yeah. Um, so I went back to Brown Foreman in, in 97 and began working with Lincoln again and um, replaced him. I didn't say, I can't say I replaced him, succeeded him upon his retirement in 2003. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great story. I mean, Chris, I mean, obviously your, your life, I mean, you, your life is about, is about bourbon. I mean, I'm a lifetime Kentuckian, um, not been in the bourbon industry, but, um, you know, growing up for me as a kid growing up, uh, you know, bourbon was just a thing. It's like Kentucky basketball. It's like fried chicken. It's there. Um, you know, it's important. Um, you, you really appreciate it, but you don't, for some reason, I've never really appreciated it as much until I got to be older and then I could really see the impact that it has on our state. Um, and there's such a sense of pride, you know, to be able to say that we are the the largest 95% or more of the bourbon in the world is produced here in Kentucky. I mean, there is as a Kentuckian, there's just a true sense of pride um, oh, yes. about that. And, but it's really cool that you grew up in that, you know, in that environment with your parents, both working uh, for Brown Foreman. That's just, that's great. So, I mean, it has been a lifetime journey for you, which is, which is really cool. No, I've been very, very fortunate. And also, yeah. as you, as you said, Mark, growing up, I thought the whole world revolved around <laughs> bourbon and what a shock when you start traveling the world and it's like, no, it doesn't. Um, but, but that's our job collectively yeah. in, uh, to uh, brands, companies, and the Kentucky Distillers Association is let's build bourbon to the size and the image and reputation enjoyed by Scotch whiskey around the world. Let's, sure. let's, 
let's aim for being number one. And, and that's what we got to do. So yep. it's, it's an excellent challenge and, and one I think we're well up to. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Well, Chris, I'll tell you what, let's, because we're at the end of session one, but um, we'll take a quick break there. But before we do, let's just wrap up, Matt, um, on, on the rye. I get some closing thoughts on that uh, real quick. Matt, what do you, what do you think on that one? I think we, we touched a lot of the great points about it. It, it drinks very much like a bourbon where it's got that, that really nice uh, caramel coming through on it. Sometimes I'll get orange in bourbon and I, de- I get the oranges on this. It doesn't have that really sharp, uh, pungent rye that you were talking about, Chris, the, the baked mm-hmm. spices come through the brown spices in it. Got a little bit of cinnamon, some nutmeg, just really comforting spice yep. with it. Not that, not a, a bright punchy, uh, like a citrusy or, um, like a, a super rye spiced, um, on it, not a peppercorn. And it, it's, it is, it's a very comforting rye. It, it leads to that really nice finish with the oak coming through and a little bit of the citrus made its way over to like the apple and the fruit, the pears, like tree fruit, as you were talking about. And I, I'm really enjoying it. I, I think yeah. it's a, a really great rye and it's really been a fun ride to hear about the history of it. Yeah, I agree with that, Matt. And you know, for me, it's funny because I don't know if it's the malted barley. I don't know what it is. Sometimes when I get things with a little bit higher bar- barley content, I almost pick up like a chocolatey taste to it. And I swear, I don't know why, but for some reason on the finish, I get, I, I'm, I, I don't know. I, for some reason I'm picking up almost a little, uh, chocolatey flavor. So no, you're absolutely right, Mark, that the, the, um, a malt note can be described as cocoa. So that's uh, okay. very, very much on. Yeah. Okay. All right. I was thinking I might be crazy there for a minute, Chris, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's what I was, that's what I was picking up. So yeah, for me, I mean, uh, like I said, Chris, you know, Matt's a big rye fan. I, I'm, I'm becoming more of a rye fan, but bourbon is where my interest is. Um, but this is, this is really good. And I'm, and I'm sorry that I've not had it <laughs> before, <laughs> before well, today, but <laughs> we, we took care of that tonight. Then That's exactly right. Yeah. I'm glad I picked this bottle up and, and I guess we should tell everybody cause I, I picked this bottle up today. Um, and I want to, this is like sub 40 bucks. Is that right? Retail? Is that a, is that a good estimate or I can't remember? It, absolutely. Okay. We have made, we have made the decision when we launched rye many years ago now, lose track of time. Uh, Mark, uh, we had it priced about five dollars higher than bourbon uh, okay. because it was a more expensive product to produce for us. Rye is sure. more expensive grain. The malt mm-hmm. is the most expensive of the rye ingredients. It required more. Anyway, it was more expensive to produce. Um, but as we've gotten into a larger volume of rye, we have brought the price down and it's line priced. So uh, theoretically, but for bourbon, rye, malt, and wheat should be priced the same. Now, it'll vary from retailer to retailer because of maybe volume discounts or whatever sure. marketplace activities in place. But we want people to enjoy our whiskeys and not charge a premium for any one whiskey over the other. Uh, yep. Obviously, we get into the double oak to master's collection. That's a, that's a different scenario because they're extremely difficult and more expensive to produce. But the core range... There is a pretty new one. Uh, the core range should be line priced or, or very close. So yeah. whatever the bourbon is, maybe a dollar two more. Gotcha. Uh, we, that's what I was really happy to see that that pricing on that. So that that was great. So I tell you what we'll do. Let's let's just take a quick break. But for me, two thumbs up, Matt, on the rye. Uh, be, I, I really enjoy it. So I like that. Um, I get it that you do as well. It seems like Matt, yeah. So yeah, absolutely, I do. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's take a quick break, get a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back with more with Chris Morse from uh, Woodford Reserve in just a minute. Hey, bourbon lifers. When you're out hunting for those hard-to-find bottles or just enjoying the distilleries of Central Kentucky, you're going to work up an appetite. And when it's time to refuel, we suggest that you visit our good friends Rebecca and Eric Burnworth at the Stave Restaurant. Located at 5711 McCracken Pike in Millville, Kentucky, close to Castle and Key in Woodford Reserve, the Stave Restaurant is just off the beaten path, nestled on the banks of Glens Creek. Chef Jonathan Sanning prepares amazing food each day featuring an elevated Kentucky-inspired cuisine. You can take our word for it, the food alone is worth the trip to the Stave. With a full-service bar, great bourbon flights, and signature cocktails, the Stave is the perfect place to catch up with friends after a fun-filled day of touring the local distilleries. And you can even purchase bottles of bourbon to take home with you while you're there. 
Make sure to follow The Stave on Instagram and Facebook at The Stave Kentucky or visit them online at thestavekentucky.com to stay up to date on everything that's going on. The Stave Restaurant is a bourbon lover's paradise right here in the heart of bourbon country. All right, everybody, welcome back for round or session two, whichever you prefer to call it, of the Bourbon Life Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Mark, and with me is my good friend, my rye drinking buddy, Matt, in the toboggan. How's it going over there, Matt? You doing all right? Oh, Mark, I'm doing really great, man. I am having a good time tonight, and more importantly, the fact isn't the fact that I'm back, but that our guest, Chris Moore, <laughs> master distiller from Woodford Reserve, is back for session number two of the Bourbon Life Podcast. So, Chris, thanks for sticking around. We got you for at least another session here, so welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. Yeah, we we appreciate that. You know, we've we've not lost a guest yet, but you know, we're we're waiting. We think that maybe at some point, one of these days, that we may somebody may just say, "Look, guys, they're they're going to do the dramatic stand up and rip the mic off and you know walk off the set, say I'm done." But we've been we've been pretty fortunate so far, Chris. <laughs> so right, so it, yeah, so the first session we talked about the the Woodford Rye, and now this session. We're moving on to, um, well, this is one I think, you know, everybody in, everybody in the world <laughs> knows about this one, but Chris, do you want to kind of tell everybody a little bit about what we're drinking on this session? Yes. We're going to drink Wood Reserve bourbon. Yes. And as we were chatting before we, we went live that, uh, we call it distiller select the, the distiller select range, which is our, our house and our flash shape bottle is now f- four products in and it's accompaniment, it is a grain recipe theme. So bourbon, which is corn dominant, rye, which we tasted earlier, which is rye dominant, wheat and malt. That's our distiller select range. Every other aspect of their production is identical. The same limestone water, the same yeast strain with a long fermentation process, same distillation, same maturation in the unique wood reserve barrel and heat cycle maturation. So the only difference between our distiller select range expressions is the grain recipe. So we try not to call our bourbon distiller select anymore. It's it's simply wood reserve bourbon. It's our okay. it's our mm-hmm. bourbon. Gotcha. And, uh, but again, old habits die hard, don't they? Yeah. Well, and you know, I'm looking at this is the and man, these derby bottles are just just fantastic, you know, with the, uh, with the painting on the, the, the front of them. And that's what I got. I just happened to have this one here. Yes. Um, uh, and this was actually from last year's Derby. Um, but still beautiful, beautiful bottle. And the bottling itself is gorgeous, but yeah. So just reading off the label distillers select, but yeah, I appreciate that clarification on, on, on the name on that, Chris. It doesn't matter. It's, it, it means something to us, but as long as people, Order and enjoy what reserve. Who cares what they call it? But uh, we have to give the late Owsley Brown the second credit for what is Woodford Reserve. Um, Owsley uh, was the fourth generation of the Brown family to hit our parent company, Brown Foreman. And of course, Owsley obviously was a bourbon, bourbon guy. Um, so he was also extremely um perceptive and intelligent and looking at the industry as a whole. And in the early 1990s, Owsley decided that Brown Foreman should create a new bourbon. Now we had early times and of course, Old Forester and not a bourbon, but we had Jack Daniels, Tennessee whiskey. And Owsley decided we should create a new bourbon. And this is literally in the depths of bourbon's decline, which is almost a 40 year decline. Right. And distilleries have been closing. There's no Kentucky bourbon trail, period. I mean, you can visit Maker's Mark and that's it. If you wanted to visit a bourbon distillery, because who wanted to, because bourbon wasn't cool. Whiskey wasn't cool. Flavored vodka ruled the land. Right. And Owsley decided we would create a new bourbon. And there was resistance even within the executive at Brown Foreman. It's a waste of time, waste of money, you know, it's going the wrong way. Um, but Housley won the day and what is now Woodford Reserve began. And what he demanded or expected of this project was a new bourbon that would have its own distillery 
and the distillery would be open for tours. It would be a home place, which is brown form and vernacular for a place to visit and feel at home, home of the brand, et cetera, because that's what we had down in Tennessee at Jack Daniels. Right. And there were parallel tracks of development, and one of them was find a historic distillery site that we could acquire and build upon. And we actually hired a couple of University of Kentucky um, uh, graduate students from the history department go out in central Kentucky. We didn't want to go way north or way east or, excuse me, west, um, stay sort of close to home and find ruins of distilleries that are worthy of, of, of uh, potential acquisition. And they spent a summer surveying central Kentucky and they came back and I'll never forget it was on those those V8 moments, they came back and said, there's this place, there's this one place you guys got to buy. It's called LeBron and Graham in Woodford County. And it's like, the V8 moment was like, oh, yeah. We're the ones who closed it in the first place. <laughs> Duh. And, uh, and that was the historic LeBron and Graham, formerly the Oscar Pepper Distillery, right. that we had acquired in 1941 from LeBron and Graham, closed in 1959. My father worked there in the past and retained into the early 1970s, closed, uh, shuttered, and then sold to the local farmer who wanted the acreage to farm. And the distillery just sat abandoned and unused, although it did deteriorate. It was pretty well intact. So that was a good, good first step. Here's the place we can make this new bourbon. Sure. And um, develop the, the package, the name, the product. And then, of course, since we're starting from an abandoned distillery that doesn't have any uh, operational um, processes in place, reconfigure the, the what we call the tour path so people can go through and operate a distillery, which is very unusual at the time. And, uh, and after tens of millions of dollars and a lot of time and effort, in October of 1996, we opened the Woodford Reserve Distillery, still called LeBron Graham at the time. Um, right and its first brand, Woodford Reserve, named after Woodford County. And, um, and that was the beginning. Very quickly, I discovered LeBron Graham was not the best name for the place. Um, um, and I proposed and eventually won uh, the debate and we changed the name to Woodford Reserve uh, in 2004. So even though LeBron Graham is part of the history of the site, it is now the Woodford Reserve Distillery. Gotcha. Yeah. And it's a beautiful distillery. I mean, for people that haven't been out there, uh, it's a it's a great place to, to visit. It's there in Woodford County, just outside of Versailles. Um, you may call it, some people may call it Versailles. <laughs> but here in Kentucky, it's Versailles. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful location, beautiful distillery. Uh, nestled there on the banks of Glens Creek, if I remember correctly, or that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's it. That's a question I wanted to ask you um, is, I mean, is Glens Creek, is that your, is that your water source or do you guys have a spring there it, that you can draw from? Exactly right. Mark um, Glens Creek is the uh, drainage system of Northern Woodford County. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's, it has many branches. We're actually on the, Grassy Springs branch okay. of, of Glens Creek. And it's a grassy spring that feeds the distillery. So we do not use the creek water water. in the creek. <laughs> it's the spring water that flows into it. But uh, along comes over many, many years ago, along comes an organization called uh, the Food and Drug Administration that, of course, our ancestors did not have to deal with. And uh, uh, current law is any water exposed to the surface must be processed, filtered, cleaned before it can go into a food processing plant. And hard to believe a, a bourbon distillery is a food processing plant because we, we do ingest, we drink and enjoy the product. Right. So uh, we did not want to process the water because anytime you process anything, you change it. And the reason the Pepper family used that spring in the first place, dating back to 1812, was because of the properties of the water to make their bourbon. So we have uh, uh, dropped a couple of deep well shafts okay. into the aquifier and we are literally tapping 
that wonderful limestone water that bubbles out of the ground in five places at the distillery. We bring the water in, never exposing it to the surface, directly into the distillery, into the process. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I wondered about that. I never knew. I never knew how that was how that was done. But you know, like I knew obviously you're on the banks there of the creek, and but I was like, yeah, I'm not. I'm pretty sure they don't. <laughs> they're not diverting the water from the creek. No, anymore. it's a it's a beautiful <laughs> creek, but you could literally yeah. go out and look at snapping turtles in it and anything else. But <laughs> it's not good to put into the product right away. Yeah, it, and it is. I agree. It is a beautiful creek because you know one of our sponsors is the the Stave Restaurant out there. Um, oh yes, they they also there are on Glens Creek, um, and it's just it's really cool when you're driving out through there between you guys and Castle and Key and the Stave. Um, it's just a beautiful drive there and and through Millville and every um, out there on McCracken Pike, but the the creek is is beautiful. So um, now when when you guys started the brand. You're, you're basically, well, I guess I, we should back up because in the first second, we talked about you and your history. And I guess we should probably clarify that you're not just really the master distiller for Woodford Reserve, that you are master distiller for Brown Foreman, correct? Yes, that's my, that's my title. And okay. so I'm involved in other brands as well, including our, our wonderful Old Forester brand. Right. Um, but uh, given the success and importance of Woodford Reserve to the company. All right. um, I really focus on the Woodford Reserve brand. I got you. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that so people understood that you were, you know, I mean, technically in, in both roles, um, that you that you are, you know, there with Brown Foreman as the headmaster distiller, but also specifically with with the Woodford Reserve brand. And when you started there with Woodford Reserve, uh, you were working under Lincoln Henderson, is that correct? Well, Lincoln was my mentor. I went yeah. to work for Lincoln in 1976, and um, he's a great friend of mine, a very dear. But when I was chosen to begin to train uh, to succeed him, never replace, but to succeed him, I was actually not, the company decided I would not report to Lincoln. I reported directly to the president of the company wanted to give me complete independence to develop without any pressure um, of these old relationships. It's very, very, um, uh, I guess, a uh, business-like decision. Sure. So that meant Lincoln and I could have debates and arguments and disagreements without my fear of any retribution, which he wouldn't have given me retribution. But um, it was, it was really an interesting connection. So, um, I was able to develop uh, sort of with Lincoln, but independently to bring my prior experiences and my opinions forward as well. So we were we were very close, and of course, um, one of the great honors of, of my career is upon his retirement. I was yeah elected to succeed him. Yeah, I mean Lincoln's obviously a, a well known figure in the bourbon industry and, and a member of the the. Um, the hall of fame obviously as as are you as well is that that's correct right you you were inducted as well into the hall of fame am i right yes I was, uh, I was i guess 2017 yeah and the 2016 uh, the international whiskey hall of fame which was a complete shock to me and uh, very <laughs> proud of both uh, uh both inclusions uh, yeah I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, congratulations on that. So and talking back, getting back to your, to the bourbon here, we talked a little bit, I don't know if we talked about the mash bill, um, on this one or not. Um, but this we one, not, but we, okay. But we're very happy to tell everyone it's 72% corn okay, and, uh, 18% rye and 10% malted bar. Okay. Matt, you've been over there nosing it for a while. I see you over there. What do you, what are you picking up on this one? Right away on the nose, I got the oranges coming through again. And I think that um, I also picked up on the oak as well. And a little bit of uh, like a little leather and something, something uh, Very good, Matt. Good, yeah, good. leather coming through. And then the, the palette on it, uh, I got it orange, oak, and leather again. But I also got some honey, like a, a toasted honey or a, a like a, mm -hmm. a toasted sweetness and then it, it gave way and, and uh followed through with 
I picked up that cocoa that you were talking about, Mark, kind of that, the bitter cocoa flavor, like a, a nice warm cocoa at the end. Yeah. I know the malted barley is not as high on this one, but I'd, I, I did pick that up on the, on the finish, like you said. And I mean, there's nothing I can say about the nose or palate, Matt, that, <laughs> that would even come close or compare um, to, to what you said. But I did get that citrus note that you talked about. I mean, obviously, to me, you know, there, there's obviously similarities between this and the rye. Um, but it's, you know, it's a bourbon and it, it drinks like a bourbon. There's to me, there's more vanilla, there's more caramel. Um, I get almost like some toasted brown sugar flavors to it as well. Um, it's just, a, it's a, there's, there's more of a sweetness to this. The rye, the rye had sweetness that gave way to that spiciness. It wasn't like you said, Matt, like a black peppercorn or really pungent, uh, as Chris said, uh, spice. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but with this, you know, I just, I get the sweetness I do, you know, obviously this has 18% rye. So, um, there is going to be a little bit of that rye note on the, on the palate. And, and I do get a little bit of that spiciness, but to me, I just, I really, I love the sweetness, um, uh, of the bourbon. It's, it's really good. Well, what you have both recognized and mentioned is the impact of the barrel. And that's where so much of the sweetness comes from. Okay. Because think about this again, as we went back to our rye discussion earlier, our bourbon and rye have the same three grains in them. They both have rye, corn, and malted barley. 10% malt for the bourbon, 14% for the rye. But the bourbon is 72% corn. The rye right. is 30%, 33%. So roughly half. And the rye is 53 rye. And the bourbon is 18% rye. They have the three same three grains, but in different configurations. But everything else is the same. Water, yeah. yeast, fermentation, distillation, maturation is the same. So I like to think of the house style. I grew up with the house style concept that has really been broken away now as some distilleries sell to many independent bottlers and different brands and house brands and you know selling to uh, chain stores. But there used to be a house style, and you could taste the whiskey and go, Oh, that's from Chinley. Oh, that's from Heaven Hill. That's from Brown Foreman. That's from Bean. You know, you knew what the style of that distillery was. And that's pretty much been broken apart by today's marketplace. But Woodford Reserve has a house style because we don't sell our whiskey to anybody. We don't buy whiskey from anybody. We make our whiskey. And therefore, you can start to see some common flavor themes because, again, there's very little difference in separation between the products. It's the grain recipe. Right. Everything else is the same. And they're all presented at 90.4 proof. So you can't say, oh, that the rye is spicier. And oh, look, it's 100 proof versus 80, 90 proof or 86 proof or 80 proof. Or the malt soft, look, it's 80 proof. No, they're all 90.4 proof. So if you taste, visually see, and knows a difference, there's one simple answer. It's the grain recipe. The grain recipe. I mean, that's really cool. And I, I appreciate that. And I, I'm glad you mentioned the proof. I was going to ask you about that because obviously um, the things that we're tasting tonight, everything's at 90.4. Um, yes. So how did that, I mean, has that always been the proof point for, for Woodford? Yes, it has. If you okay. look historically, and I'm a big, big believer in the validity and importance of the history of our industry. If you look back into the 19th century, you had roughly two proof points, 90 proof and 100 proof. Even after the Bottle and Bond Act was passed, there were 90 proof bourbons. Okay. They, obviously, they weren't bottled and bond, but they were 90 proof. So that's a historic Kentucky proof presentation, 90 proof. Why point four? Sort of been put into, uh, uh, made obsolete by the most recent 2020 change in some regulations by the TTB, which of course we old timers, you and Mark and I would know as the BATF, yeah. um, the, the rules governing proof presentation. And you had um, a very tight leeway uh, on what the proof in the bottle could be. You said 90 proof, it could be 90 point up to 90.2 or down to 89.8. There is a little swing because it's very difficult over the course of a bottling run to maintain proof because things such as humidity in the air will 
will adjust proof on a bottom line. Hard to believe, but it's true. So we put 90.4 because we wanted to always make sure we were above 90. We're never going to drop below 90. Now the government has expanded that range. So 90.4 is sort of like, eh, doesn't matter anymore, but we're going to stick to it anyway. So there was a, there was a technical reason and a historical reason for the 90.4. I gotcha. Oh, that's a good explanation. Yeah, that's, that's great. You know, and you were talking about your barrels. Um, you guys, Brown Foreman has, you have your own cooperage. Um, can you kind of talk a little bit about that? I mean, what drove that decision, um, you know, to have yeah. the, your cooperage and then also how you guys toast and cause you guys toast and char, if I remember correctly, can you, that's right. Yeah. Well, you, the, the, um, the industry coming out of the second world war, um, many of the distilleries in Kentucky and, and nationally when they were in distillers in Illinois and Iowa and, and uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio places, I had their own cooperages. And these were the big distilleries, the Shinleys, the Nationals, the McKessons, uh, the, the, Feder the Federal of the world. And these big distilleries had cooperages to supply all their distilleries. And little old Brown Foreman in 1945 decides, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna build our own cooperage. We want to be like the big boys, and we we established what was called Bluegrass Cooperage in Louisville, and we were making our own barrels. And of all things, of course, now we're the only distillery that makes its own barrels right. because all these behemoths are long gone. So we've been making barrels now for 76 years. We've been wow. making whiskey barrels longer than anybody in the country. So we think we know how to make a whiskey barrel. <laughs> yeah, and, I tell you so. <laughs> and also, we also used to make wine barrels. We had a cooperage in California. We no longer have it. We're no longer actively in the wine business outside of the Sonoma, Sonoma Couture uh, brand. But we used to make a lot of wine barrels. And we would make wine barrels for other wine companies as well. That's part of being in business. And we learned a lot about toasting of wine barrels for these great vineyards out in California, which we did not own. So we were dealing with winemakers and um, learned a lot. So when we're developing wood for reserve, it's like, hmm, there's some aspects of wine barrel making that we should apply to this new bourbon brand because they're really impactful on flavor formation. So we created the first whiskey barrel that was purposely toasted like a wine or a cognac barrel okay. and then charred it like a bourbon barrel. So this new hybrid barrel was created for Woodford Reserve. And it was part of that, the secret sauce, the secret process that has made this brand so special. The first toasted and then charred whiskey barrel. Yeah. So what, what char level do you guys char at on that? Can you, can you say, well, <laughs> or does it well, matter? I mean, it does matter, right? But it, it does matter. And we'll round it up to a three. Okay. But we, we focus on time. Um, okay. How long the barrel is charred and we char for 25 seconds. Okay. But so we'll round it up. That's around a, a three char. Gotcha. I mean, that's, that's uh it, you can just tell in the barrel, the, the, the product. I mean, it's, it's amazing that the flavor and I, I keep drinking this Woodford, um, you know, Matt had mentioned the, the toasted marshmallow. And product. that's a good call. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sitting here with this Woodford and as I, as I drink it, I, it's just like, as it opens up more, I, I get this marshmallowy delicious, you know, like sitting around a campfire, uh, and browning up a nice <laughs> sweet marshmallow. Uh, and that's what it reminds me of in the glass. It's crazy. Yes, Woodford Reserve is a very complex whiskey, obviously bourbon, and it's also very balanced. And we have proven this scientifically and through sensory science. Um, and um, and how do you how do you judge it scientifically? Um, you go through the chemical analysis. You compare right. it as we do to the great competitors in the industry, and we find out that Woodford Reserve is extremely balanced. And when you have a product that's balanced, it's difficult to talk about its flavor profile because flavor perception is very individual. It's very personal. Right. And we each have a different ability to discern, describe flavors. So what Matt might find in Woodford and you, Mark, 
might be different than I. We're all right because we find what we find. When you are complex and balanced, that really allows our own palate preference to lead us. So some people might find Woodford is wonderfully, but again, gently spiced. And somebody might find it has wonderful wood character or sweet aromatics, or boy, this is fruity. I cannot tell you what you taste, what you nose in Woodford, because I don't know you. I can tell you my nose and taste. But again, when you have approximately 215 flavor compounds out of a total of 300 available to American whiskey based on on analysis, it's very complex. Um, When you are out of balance, it's more easy to describe. We'll talk about double oaked in in a little bit. Double oaked is out of balance. I'll tell you exactly what you know as it tastes because I know what you know as it tastes because it's out of balance. When you're balanced, it's up to the individual. And that, I think, has been one of the keys to the success of Woodford Reserve. The individual will find in Woodford Reserve what they like. They will find what they want to find. Complex flavors in balance. So Woodford Reserve becomes what you want it to be. And that's, I think, really important. Uh, It's hard to believe we launched this brand less than 25 years ago. It's now the fifth largest bourbon period. Wow. That after yeah. Bullet, Makers, Evan, and Jim. This is now the world's fifth largest bourbon, highest price to the group. It's incredible how yeah. this brand is embraced by people across the world. Yeah, it, it, it is. And like I said, you know, before, uh, Chris, when I, you know, as a college student and a, a young attorney, <laughs> when I would drink bourbon, I mean, I just, you know, I would just buy whatever I was used to drinking in college. Um, and then I remember when I, when I first drank, Woodford Reserve, and this was probably 20 years ago. Um, you know, and just after you guys have been out for probably just a few years. Yes. yes. That to me, it, it, I mean, I felt like I was an adult. <laughs> I felt like uh, <laughs> that I had graduated to a, to a big boy, uh, a, a big boy bourbon. Um, I really did. So, and it, it has me, remained one of my, one of my favorite go tos. Um, and like I said, my wife, though, she's a huge Woodford fan. And That's great. Yeah, so she she absolutely loves it. So I'll tell you what, we probably should wrap up this session as well. Um, but before we do, Matt, you got some closing thoughts on the on the Woodford? Mark, I think I've got to echo pretty much exactly what you just finished there and pull a little bit, Chris, about uh, the balance that you were talking about. When I, back before I was really, really enjoying uh, drinking bourbon, just this these were back in the days when we were drinking whatever we could get our hands on. Uh, whenever somebody had a, a bottle of Woodford, it was like, it was big news. <laughs> so like, it, uh, it, this, it, it kind of had a, a stigma for my, my much younger self. And, and, and Mark, um, I, I got to agree with you there. And then Chris, you, you talk about the balance. I think this would probably be my definition of a well, balanced bourbon yep. when i go out somewhere okay. and i look through a big long list and i'm just i'm looking for something that i know i'm going to be able to pull a whole lot of really great balanced flavor i'm not going to taste something kind of wacky or goofy or off the charts in one direction like woodford is just is a very great standby it's a a, a perfect bourbon that i would stand to recommend to anybody looking for for just a balanced pour that uh, again chris like you said they're going to be able to find just about any any flavor in there that they can it's it's all there and there's no right or wrong answer to it it's that complex and that balanced that's great thank you yeah i agree with that and to me it's a it's a bourbon that that i would not hesitate for someone um, you know, obviously Matt and I do this. We, we love doing it. We, we've drank bourbon for years, but we do have people that reach out to us that are just getting into it. Um, and to me, this is one of the bourbons that is definitely something that for someone who's just trying to begin an adventure, a journey into the world of bourbon, I mean, Woodford Reserve is at the top of the list of one of those bourbons that, that would be the perfect, uh, jumping off point for someone trying to, trying to get into the, to the world of bourbon. 
All right, guys. So let's take a quick break, get a, okay. word, get a word from our sponsor, and we'll come back with our final session in just a minute. Hey, Bourbon Lifers. We want to take just a second and tell you a little bit about Three Chord Whiskey. Three Chord's line of whiskeys embody the spirit of creativity. The whiskey is a true collaboration between producer and composer Neil Giraldo and master blender distiller Ari Sussman. The Three Chord team of expert blenders, coopers, and sensory professionals have developed a multi-step process they call perfectly tuned taste. This process begins by carefully selecting the finest bourbon and rye whiskeys from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Indiana, and then blending them all together. After each blend is completed, the Three Chord team then applies their proprietary process of pyrolysis, that's a lot to say, isn't it? Which involves heating American oak to precise temperatures to release specific flavor and aroma compounds. Then they use another proprietary method called rhythmic disruption process, and that's more than just playing music to a bunch of barrels which integrates all of those related compounds into the blended spirit. Finally, each small batch blend of three quart is evaluated by a trained sensory panel to ensure an uncommon depth of flavor, character, aroma, and a perfectly tuned taste in each bottle. With their introductory blended bourbon, their Amplify Rye, Strange Collaboration, which is a Pinot Noir finished Kentucky bourbon, their 94 rated 12 bar reserve, and the brand new highly coveted 15 year Kentucky bourbon they call the Whiskey Drummer, there's a lot of options available from Three Chord. Like the feeling you get when you hear that perfect song, you'll know that the Three Chord line of whiskeys are right from the first sip. They resonate with so much flavor, you'll want an encore. Find out more about Three Chord whiskeys and distribution in your area at www.threechordbourbon.com. All right, everybody, welcome back for the third and final session of the Bourbon Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and with me, as always, is my toboggan beanie-wearing friend, Matt. Matt, you're hanging in there, man. You doing okay over there? Oh, you know I am. I'm doing great this evening, Mark. We are back for session number three, and as always, Bourbon Lifers, you've made it this far, <laughs> so you best stick around That's right. for session number three Don't miss because this. we have the exciting conclusion with Chris Morris, the master distiller from Woodford Reserve finishing out session number three with us. So Chris, welcome back. Thank you, man. And Chris, thanks for hanging out for the rest of the, the show with us. We yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> so um, on this third round, we'll go ahead and jump right into what we're drinking. Chris, do you mind just to let everybody know what it is we have and tell us a little bit about this one? Yes, we're going to finish our wonderful evening with Wood Reserve Double Oaked. And, uh, We've talked about our rye. We've talked about our core and foundation product, Wood Reserve Bourbon. And a lot of people don't even really realize that Wood Reserve Double Oaks is a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey as well. So this is the ultimate expression of our bourbon family. Yeah, and and I've been a big fan of this one. And we're actually drinking, I've got a single barrel. This is a store pick. Um, from the guys down at Jackson's Wine and Spirits here in Lexington um, that they did earlier last year. Um, yes. um, but yeah, I mean, this, this double oaked is, is uh, well, it, I mean, it's, it's delicious. I mean, there's no other way to, to explain it. Um, but now this is, this is, so people understand what it is if they've not had it. This is the, the Woodford Reserve bourbon mm -hmm. and you take it and finish it in another, charred toasted barrel is that correct that's right and that's why it is still mark a kentucky straight bourbon whiskey okay. because as you look at the regulations the regulations are the standards of identity only specify or require that bourbon be stored in a new charred oak barrel it doesn't say how many new charred oak barrels right. it must touch so the original with reserve barrel is new and charred and the double oaked barrel is always new and charred. Okay. So we are finishing in a new charred oak barrel. But the secret or the difference between the two barrels is in the toast and char levels. So as we were discussing previously, the Woodford Reserve barrel was a groundbreaking barrel back in the early 1990s. It was the first whiskey barrel in history of whiskey making, Scotch, Irish, bourbon, you name the whiskey. The first whiskey barrel in the world that was toasted like a wine or a cognac cask would be prior to being charred, two separate steps. Okay. Unique barrel. 
The double oaked barrel is processed the same, but the exposure to the toast and heat temperatures is the complete opposite of the original barrel. So we have no secrets at Woodford Reserve. We will tell you exactly what you want to know because we think we're no one can replicate us. Right. So the Woodford Reserve barrel is toasted for 10 minutes okay. and charred for 25 seconds. You ask what our char level was, three char, but basically that, that's our 25 second char. Okay. The double oak barrel is toasted for 40 minutes. So it's toasted four times longer than the Woodford barrel and charred for a mere five seconds. Oh, that's, that's less than a one char. If you want to go on the, that, that, that scale, it basically, we set the barrel of fire and douse it immediately. And it, that whole process is a five second process. Okay. So the barrel is charred, but very briefly, because the secret to the flavor is the toasting Toast. process. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. We take fully mature Woodford, could be bottled as Woodford Reserve, and, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> pardon me, and we rebarrel it in the new barrel. And it's finishing for up to a year. Okay. Second barrel. And the color doubles. The flavor just explodes in the sweet aromatic characteristics that come from the toasting of a barrel. And we present it at 90.4 proof, as we talked about earlier, right. our rye versus our bourbon. All of our products are presented at the same proof level. So you can't go, oh, double oaked is smoother. It must be 80 proof or it's hotter. It must be 98 or 100 proof. No. It's all the same proof. So the only difference you can ascribe to the profile is the second barrel. That's the reason. And thus the name double oaked is descriptive of the process. Gotcha. So Chris, I don't, I don't think we ever talked about this earlier tonight, but in terms of the actual maturation, um, I, I know these are, these are non age stated, um, and, and, you know, Matt and I've learned over the, over the course of the year or so that we've been doing this podcast that, that, you know, age is really not <laughs> something, uh, with a bourbon that you, that you need to focus on, but do you have, can you give us an idea of where you guys are in terms of your maturation on that, on the regular, the baseline wood for yeah. reason? Yeah, absolutely. And we have to keep in mind, if you go pre-prohibition, the great bourbon barons that made our industry what it is, they did not use age claims. In fact, in the congressional uh, um, testimony that Bernheim and our George Garvin Brown and W.H. Taylor, e, I'm sorry, E.H. Taylor, uh, yeah. these historic, historic figures in our industry, in front of the United States Congress, in the Supreme Court chambers, making their testimony, they say bourbon is meant to be aged, they use the term aged, six to eight years. That's the sweet point of yeah. bourbon. Okay. But that's historically what bourbon is supposed to be like. That's not a knock on heavily aged whiskeys, but that's what the men who created our industry said was the way bourbon was to be aged. So that's what we do at Woodford Reserve. That's our sweet spot. Now we will go, we'll, we will dip down to barrels that are five and a half years of age and then move on up into the eight year range. And every bottling of Woodford Reserve is a batching process because we, we know that the consumer wants their glass of Woodford to taste the same as the glass they, they had a month ago or two years ago, whatever, or when they're in San Francisco on vacation or in New York City on a business trip, they want their glass of wood for the taste the same. And the only way you can do that is by batching barrels together. Barrels from different production dates, different age ranges, different warehouse locations to bring the individual characteristics of those barrels together on a calculated 
process to make the resulting batch taste the same. And we're shooting for approximately 100 barrels of that concept okay. to make a bottling bar. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you that. Well, I was going to ask you that as well in terms of your batches. So that that's, that's good to know. Um, yeah, that seems remarkably small. Yeah, it does. It, it really is. It, it is. And, and now we bake that into the equation because that's what our batch tanks are built to hold. So we're, <laughs> we're now limited by, by the physical size of our batch tanks. Gotcha. But, um, um, so there is no age of Woodford because it's a batch of you know, various ages and various production dates within a year, for example. Right. And, and that's what we're, we're targeting. And that's the same for the rye, the malt, the wheat, the double oaked. It's not of a single year's production that would limit to us to the, our limit, our ability to deliver a consistent flavor profile. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Chris, I have to say, just talking to you tonight, I'm just, and just something I've never realized about Woodford, but I mean, it's like, it's like the whole, the entire brand. I mean, you guys pay homage to the history of Kentucky bourbon in what you guys are doing. Um, and I appreciate you, you sharing that with us and our listeners uh, to understand that it's just not about producing a brand and producing a bourbon or a rye or another whiskey but it's about paying attention to what the history of this industry has been. And, and you guys are really uh, doing things that are, that are in line with that, with that history. And that's really cool. Well, thank you, Mark. As, as, as we were talking earlier, I think as a Kentuckian and my first great great grandmother was born in, in Kentucky in 1788 in Paris before we were Kentucky, before we were a state, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I think this product, bourbon, is so important in telling the culture and history of Kentucky. Yep. It's a sense of pride and, a, and an obligation that we have to do it right. And yep. yes, there's lots of new, new processes, new concepts, and those are all fine and good. And bourbon is being made, as we all know, across the country in micro distilleries. And, you know, they each have their own story. But this is where bourbon originates. Bourbon originates with the foundation, the founding of Kentucky. And I just think it's too important to shortcut or to belittle anything that has gone on in the past. So I'm really proud that we're able to maintain in our own way at Brown Form and the integrity of our industry in both Old Forester and Woodford Reserve. I think, uh, I think yep. that's, that's our duty to the industry. Well, I mean, I think that's great. And, you know, we had Jackie on the show a couple months ago and I just enjoyed having her on um, and, you know, drinking the, the 1910. That's what she gave us the option. She's like, what do you guys want to drink? And I was like, I'd really love to drink the 1910. Good. Um, <laughs> and it's so funny now, you know, drinking, drinking the double oaked and, and the 1910. Um, I mean, just, I know they're different barrels cause she talked about the fact that the, I guess the 1910 barrels are just pretty much charred beyond, uh, anything else, but there's a lot of similarities to it. Um, there's a lot of just, uh, sweetness. There's a lot of just amazing flavors that are imparted. Um, to this, but just, uh, just love what you guys are doing. There's you know, no, no other way to say it. That's a fun story. Um, my good friend now retired um, from Brown Foreman, Mac Brown, who is a fourth generation Brown family member. He had acquired um, a lot of material, I'd say material because it's point of sale and bottles and things from an individual who had been given them uh, had been given to him by the late Owsley Brown, who was Mac's cousin. Yep. Um, and Mac said, hey, c- come over and look at this stuff I bought. So I went over to Mac's house and what a, we had a great, spent a great day looking at, you know, a 1945 old Forester display card, you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And we're rummaging through all this material that Mac had bought. And we come across an unopened, 
wooden case. It's a Brown Fullman Slurry Company. And I've got one of those cases, of course, it's empty, that I got from my father. So it's a wooden whiskey box, wooden case. Right. Like, oh my gosh, Mac, what, what is this? Fully expecting it to be filled with old Forrester. He goes, I don't know. I said, should we open it? And I said, it's yours. You bought it. Let's open it. So we got a screwdriver and a hammer, and we opened up this case. They were nailed shut. It's like, I always feel like it was a, a, a Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, <laughs> Indiana Jones. <laughs> we opened this box, and there's 12 quarts in this box. Like, oh, my gosh. You know, pull one out. And it's not an old bottle of old Forrester. And, and the labels, obviously, at this point, they're, they're over, you know, it's like 102 years old. Right, right, yeah. And and silverfish and things have been eaten on the labels, and some labels were in better shape than others. Like, oh, my gosh, what is this? Old fine whiskey. Oh. How's the right. like, Ah, what is this? And I'm reading the labels and, it, and, and it's the double barreling of old Forrester and heavily charred barrels after the fire. Right. And, and I turned mm-hmm. to Mac. So double Oaks has been on the market now for two years or so. I said, <laughs> Mac, Owsley Brown double Oaked a hundred years before we did. And I thought I was so smart. We had done it a hundred years before. Like, it was amazing. And that led to more research and you know discovered all the backstory. And that led to 1912, 1910 for the for the um, whiskey row series. But it was tremendous. Um, what a story. Yes. Oh, yeah. so, so heavily charred barrel. Yeah. For, no, no toasting. They didn't do that. Heavily charred barrel for 1910. And the heavily toasted barrel for double oak. So yeah. two completely, I could say on record on your show, two completely <laughs> different processes that were not known to each other until that one moment at Mac Brown's house when I like God. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's wow. that's awesome. So Matt, what are you what are you picking up on the uh, on this uh, double oak over there? Well, Mark, I didn't even have to bring the glass up to my nose to catch the sweetness yeah. and the marshmallow yes. coming off of it. I just needed to pour a little bit and it was there. And man, it's got such a great sweet nose. Uh, I picked up marshmallow. I get a toasted or a brulee sugar out of it as well. Got a nice brown sugar, yeah. toasted sugar. Uh, and also I get a little bit of cherry or some sort of, hmm. uh, like a sweeter stone okay, fruit good. coming off the nose on this one as well. well yeah. Matt, as we talked about earlier, I can tell you pretty much what you're going to nose and taste with double oak because it's completely out of balance towards right. those heavy, sweet aromatic notes. So, uh, again, butterscotch, maple syrup, caramel, cream brulee, honey, chocolate, I mean, they're all just, it's like walking into a candy shop. But yeah. to Matt's point, it's still wood for reserve. It started as fully mature wood for reserve. It has fruit, spice, wood, and grain character in it. But they're a little more difficult to perceive because they're layered over with this tremendous sweet aromatic finish. Um, but the, the fruit migrates, it does. So you're, it's going to be very difficult to find the delicate tree fruit because the fruit's going to become very mature, the ripe cherries, uh, dates, cr- uh, cranberries, figs, raisins, you know, the more waxed or caramelized fruit notes. Uh, the spices are going to become even more warm. But yeah, there's little hints of mint in here and things like that. So it takes a lot of patience to get into the depths of master's collection of master's collection, excuse me, double oaks, because yeah. that top layer is just so massive out of balance mm-hmm. towards the sweet aromatic. Yeah. Notes. yeah. Yeah. That's what Matt was saying. And the maple syrup. I mean, I, I get that the, the toasted sugars, the marshmallow. Um, 
yeah, I mean, everything is in there and it's so sweet. This to me, and, and with the 1910, as I told Jackie on the show, um, I mean, it's like a dessert, uh, bourbon to me. This is something that, that I enjoy to drink on, um, later in the evening after dinner and really just enjoy that, the sweetness that, um, that this, that this has the double oak, this is delicious. Yes. And as Jackie was talking, that 1910 barrel is extremely difficult to produce. I'll never forget the day we were trialing the barrels out at the out at the cooperage, and um, we're pulling the fire hoses off the walls, and the alarms are going. <laughs> um, it came when the cooperage uh, guys are scared. I get scared. It was, it was oh my gosh! Yeah, and I had to make the, I had to make the decision that uh, what is a heavily charred barrel? Is that a, yeah, right here. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. Well, it. now, Chris, I mean, when you guys do, we talked about you know your your rye and your your standard. I mean, I, I hate to use the word standard, but your your bourbon. Um, and then the, the double oak, but you guys do a lot of other stuff, man. You're, you are, you know, it's funny cause I refer to some other master distillers as mad scientists, but you really are a mad scientist. I mean, you, you guys experiment a lot over there at Woodford and put out some, some really cool stuff. Can you talk a little bit about, about those, those products? And as you do, nobody can see this, but I'm going to hold up my little personal collection. Yeah. Of series. Yeah of well, different different distillery series and you know the four grain the three grain the the you know the 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 four wood the five grain the double double oat <laughs> so well i think um sort of brings out the child in any of us you know, growing up in the industry um coming into the distillery and um, and the the R and D, what is called R and D, the old brown Foreman lab where I worked. Um, you know, like, why do we do this? Why do we use oak barrels? Because requirements or regulations say so. It's like the little child going, "Mom or Dad, why is the sky blue?" Because, you know, <laughs> because you know, don't yeah. ask questions, kid. It's the way it is. So I grew up in the industry. And, and goodness gracious, we had not had a new product in the industry in decades. Uh, right. You know, no new products, no innovation. And so I was asking questions. Why are we doing this? Why do we do that? Why can't we? Ah, no, shut up. Um, <laughs> and of course, when you're young, you just like shut up and, and you go in the throat. But when you have uh, increasing uh, a level of responsibility and the ability to do things, I could start going like, hmm, why don't we try this? Why don't we, right. like early on with uh, the master's collection, why all bourbon sour mash? Why why don't we do sweet mash anymore? Well, this is because it's the way it's been. Okay, well, let's try, let's try sweet mash. And you know, off we go. Now we're in the history books. Um, so I think it was just a lot of being at the right place at the right time and, and that generational shift. And uh, of course, I was very fortunate to have known the great Elmer T. Lee and still know Charles Medley and obviously Lincoln. And I didn't yeah. know Booker very well, but I was exposed to Booker and certainly Jimmy and, and uh, Ova Haney and I knew Ed Foote very well, no Ed Foote. Um, so I was at the right place at the right time. Um, and I could start, let's, let's try some different things. And no one said no. As long as I can justify it, you know, we're in a business, so I have to have cost and, and uh, right, processes right. and everything developed and, and um, make a business presentation and a business case uh, to the company. It's just not all, hey, let's do this and see what happens. You have to you have to have a, a good backing um, before you go forward. But. Um, and. And what reserve was so small in the early days that it really didn't have an impact on the business. If we screwed up, no harm, no foul, uh, no foul, right. no harm, whatever reserve it is. Um, uh, so uh, just again, at the right place at the right time. And after some early successes, it's finally like, you know, give the guy, you know, uh, the leash because he's, everything's turning out okay. 
So again, you know, just good timing, good place. To yeah. Be. Well, I mean, like I said, these products, and I, I will tell you, Chris, that the double double oak is near and dear to my heart. I mean, that is, uh, that's a product that you guys put out. That's part of the distillery series. And I guess hopefully that'll be coming out um, sometime soon for this year. Um, yes. Uh, what, it'll be. <laughs> if, if you can speak to that or not, but I know there's a lot of inter interested people out there that want to know about the double double for this year. Yeah, it uh, should be at the end of the month um, okay. in, in Kentucky. It's sold only in Kentucky, uh, probably right. at the visitor center. And some, that's something I'm very proud of and pleased with. Um, you know, because we, we hear questions over the years that, you know, some companies sell this brand in this country only, it goes to Japan only or whatever, and we don't have a chance to get it. That's never been something that we have done. Right. The people of Kentucky get whatever we produce and nice. get the most of it in the world because Kentucky is our home place. Kentucky is what made Woodford Reserve. So nobody gets anything special or different than we get. So we get the highest allocations of master's collection. We get all the distillery series. Wood, Wood Reserve ground one, round zero is Kentucky. So again, the distillery series is our reward, our thank you to the people of Kentucky and to those people who travel to Kentucky, which is important for our economy. Sure. And right. the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, and of course, obviously visit Woodford Reserve. It's our thank you for making the journey to Kentucky. And uh, we're going to stick with that. So Double Double Oak will come out this year as anticipated, very late January. It'll, it'll last as long as it lasts, which last year was three days. <laughs> which was yep, the fastest well, you know, turnaround I, ever. Uh, and, uh, I had six bottles, uh, Chris, and you know nobody else listening can see, but that's, that's all I've got left. <laughs> now, and because of that, Mark, um, this year we are going to impose a four-bottle limit because uh, people were buying four <laughs> cases and things. Oh. Uh, that's uh, it, no, Mark. Me, I bought six bottles. That's uh, it. So. It's going to be a, a four bottle per person, just so hopefully more people will have the opportunity sure. to enjoy double double oaks. Yep. No, I I can appreciate that. I understand because I, I knew it was funny, Chris. Funny story. I was I was at work. I, I live in Lexington. I work in Louisville a couple of days a week, and I was reading an article on um, uh, I don't know Bourbon Review or something about the double double oak was going to come out uh, like this weekend and it was the first of january of last year <clears throat> so i called the distillery and and a lady answered the phone and i said i asked her i'm like well i'm calling about the double double oak and i just wanted to make sure when you guys are open on saturday because i know you're going to be releasing it this weekend and she said well now honey that's already out on the shelf <laughs> And I said, wait a second, what do you, wait, wait, it's Thursday afternoon. Well, you're telling me that, that it's a double, double oak is on the shelf. She's like, honey, they put that out about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> so I shut down my computer, left the office. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to leave for the day. Just call me on my cell phone if you need me. Yeah, very, um, very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and the, the, the visitor center will usually have it on sale first and then our great retailers will have it yeah. a couple of days later. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's, it's uh, honestly, it's one of my favorites. And I mean, everything, like I said, the Woodford reserve, um, it, it's a great bourbon. One of the first that I felt like I was a real bourbon drinker when I drank it, the double oak is delicious, but the double, the double double just has a, has a really special place in my heart <laughs> for me. Um, so I know we've run over Chris and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to keep you this late. Um, we appreciate that, but I was going to ask you a question as a master distiller. I mean, you've been in this industry, um, for a long time. And, um, I'm just curious what, as a master distiller in the, in the industry, what is the one thing that you're like, you're most proud of that you've done? Well, well, thank you for asking that Mark. Um, I really, gosh, it wasn't any individual thing. I've done. Sure. It's the industry. And I'm again, 
I was fortunate to represent Brown Fullman on the Kentucky Distillers Association board when there were only six members uh, being uh, Diageo, Brown Foreman, Four Roses, Wild Turkey, Heaven Hill. Um, we, we were, you know, like the last, the last of the last. And we stood up and continued to fight for the heritage, the quality right. of our industry. And slowly but surely, when we were emptying bottles on the Capitol steps, when the governor raised the tax, well, the legislator rose, raised our taxes, I forget how many years ago that was, uh, that was a turning point where we stood up and said, enough's enough. We're important to Kentucky. We're important to the economy of Kentucky, to the people of Kentucky, to the image of Kentucky. And that right. was a change. And so we have stood together and now bourbon is cool. Bourbon is hot, bourbon is growing. <laughs> and across the country, micro distilleries across the country, if we can make bourbon as good as they do in Kentucky, they used to say, we know we've made it. Now they're smack talk, uh, uh, smack talking us, but that's one thing. Right. But we, we fought for our industry. And when no one else was, we did. And I was, I'm proud to be part of that, part of Brown Foreman, the oldest spirits company in America, the only one to have survived prohibition and still in operation today under the same management. Um, I think that's a great story. And um, I, I like yep. to think as we go forward, uh, and that was part of, part of that effort to, to make bourbon what it is again today. So that, that's what I'm proud of. Well, that's, that's a great answer, Chris. And, and, you know, as a Kentuckian, I appreciate that. I appreciate what you guys have done. Um, I know you've been a brand since you know, the nineties, but the, the distillery and the history runs so much deeper than that. And, um, and I appreciate that, you know, as a kid growing up in Eastern Kentucky, there were things that you're proud of. And as a, as I've gotten older, you know, the bourbon industry is one of the things that I'm as a Kentuckian, that I'm, I'm very proud of, you know, I think people have a perception of, of what Kentucky is. Um, and when you have things like bourbon and basketball that we're successful in <laughs> and whatnot, I mean, it, it's really nice to have things that you can be proud of and the bourbon industry and what you guys, what you guys do. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that as a native Kentuckian that I'm extremely proud of. So, uh, I appreciate the work and effort you guys have done there at Woodford. Sure to share that message across the, the globe. No, thank you. Yeah, it's, we're, we're all in it together. And again, we are, we are a signature industry uh, yep. of the Commonwealth. We're very proud of that. I agree. So Chris, um, before we wrap it up here real quick, is there anything coming up with Woodford things going on with, uh, with you or um, with Woodford that you want to share with everybody? Let them know what's up. Well, we do have some fun things, uh, on the horizon, as we've already talked about, Double Double Oaked will be on the market soon. So we're getting into the 2021 uh, uh, expressions of the distillery series. We'll have three this year, as always. And um, Great. and Batch Proof will be coming out soon as well. And uh, very limited. And then hard, hard not to think about it. Derby bottle comes out very short. There you go. Very shortly after batch. That's right. So uh, That's and, right. Uh, we are uh, going to be celebrating. I think it's Derby 147. Hard to believe. Uh, yeah. Official, That's right. Official sponsor, presenting sponsor of the Kentucky Derby. Uh, we were working on that just today. So Derby bottles on the way. So just a lot of exciting, um, uh, sort of the same, uh, but every year it's different. Uh, and um, and uh, also, if you've read the news, and starting this month, later this month, we start some expansion at the distillery as we continue to build our infrastructure. Uh, yep. New warehouse is being built, uh, beginning the infrastructure changes that will allow us to add three more pot stills uh, this year. So a lot of physical expansion 
a lot of engineering to go uh, on this year, which I love as we get ready to make more Woodford for the future. That sounds great. And uh, we want to encourage everybody um, to go out and visit Woodford Reserve uh, when you're here in Kentucky out there. And um, I guess it's just outside of Versailles. I, don't, I guess your address is technically Versailles, Kentucky. Um, that's but you're on that's the address, but uh, a crack and pike, <laughs> grassy springs crack and all pike. combined. We're, we're out in the countryside. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. So, all right. So before we wrap it up here, uh, Matt, final thoughts on the, on the double oak. I don't think we, we touched on that before we get out of here. <laughs> so what do you think? Oh, it's a, it's a double thumbs up and, uh, it's, this is such a, such a great bourbon. And Mark, like you're saying, this is like a, a perfect dessert bourbon. And Chris, as you were talking them and it, you said it's out of balance and it, it's hard for me to believe like that. I'm sitting here with a master distiller telling me that we're drinking such a great product that he describes as out of balance because it, it's just, if it is out of balance, yeah. then I'm okay with that. Yeah. Out of balance the, is not a negative. The, it's the just sweetness. Yeah. You're, you are absolutely right. It's uh, kind of a deceptive way to describe it, but the, the sweetness and the toastiness that comes through with it. And then you had said that if you, you play with it long enough, you can pick up more of the Woodford because it is still Woodford in there before yes. you do the, the second barreling. And I was, I was able to get more of uh, like the apricot and kind of that, uh, the citrus fruit coming through and it does leave with a little bit of spice on it as well. So uh, even though it is just so sweet, so delicious, it, it still does have that really great backbone that all your products have. And, uh, this is a, oh, a big thing. two thumbs up from me. Yeah, I agree. And while you guys were talking about that, I, I already poured up uh, a little bit of the Masters collection oh. this year's special. <laughs> what do you think of our new package? <laughs> oh my gosh, this is Chris. This bottle, this is gorgeous. I mean, this is such a beautiful bottle, and we could probably have an entire episode about about this. Um, the the new release the very fine rare well, bourbon. Why don't we plan on that? Stuff. Let's let's do a master collection yeah. talk in the future. We can do that. I, yeah, I think that would be great, Chris. Because uh, yeah, I, I got that about a week ago, and I, I'm trying to savor it. You know, just pace myself with it. But it's <laughs> it's <laughs> it's amazing. It's it's uh it's a very good uh very good pour. So very happy, Chris. We appreciate you being with us tonight and sorry, we held you so long. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Well, we appreciate, we appreciate that. And like I said, we, you know, we hate to hate to run over, but man, we just, we want our guests to hear the stories and uh, hear what you have to say. And we appreciate you sharing such great stories. Um, That's what bourbon bourbon's all about is, um, you know, having, having fun with friends and getting to share some pours and and listening to stories. So we appreciate that. Thank you guys so very much. And I look forward to our visits in the future. Appreciate that. Anything before we uh, wrap it up, Chris, anything you want to add or close it out or anything? Uh, Just like to uh, thank everyone for listening and uh, hope we can see you at the distillery soon. Take care. Great. Thanks, Chris. All right, Matt, before we wrap it up, anything you want to add? Chris, thank you for being with us tonight, being such a great guest. I think this episode, maybe more than any, really epitomizes what Mark and I wanted the bourbon life to be, which was just people sitting around sharing great stories over great bourbon. And the fact that we could tie the stories to the bourbon and learn about, uh, Chris, where you came from and how you came to the industry and the reflection of yourself in this bourbon and we were drinking and it just, it ties the whole thing together. And, and this really was like a, a perfect bourbon life oh, podcast episode, in my opinion, Matt, I couldn't have said that better, man. I, I honestly, I mean, I, I really agree with you. That's, that's uh, that's a great way to sum it up. So with that said, I'm going to thank our sponsors again, uh, the Stave restaurant out in Millville, Kentucky oh. on McCracken Pike, just down the road from uh, had, Reserve. a wonderful so, lunch there. <laughs> there you go. So you can uh, head out to head out to the stave and uh, check them out and uh, see them online at the uh, 
thestavekentucky.com. And then also uh, Three Chord Bourbon, our newest sponsor. We appreciate their support as well. And uh, with that said, I'm going to wrap it up, send us home with our tagline, which is, may your glasses always be full and may you keep on living the bourbon life. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Bourbon Life Podcast. Our mission at the Bourbon Life is simple, to share our passion for all things bourbon with you every week. And we'd really love to hear your thoughts on how we're doing. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Bourbon Life. You can also contact us by email at thebourbonlife at gmail.com. And you can always find us on your favorite podcast platform. If you have a moment, we'd love it if you would rate us and give us a review. So until next week, we hope your glass is always full and that you keep on living the bourbon life.